Episode 300. Kind of crazy to have gotten this far covering nothing but DOS titles. I mean, outside of fillers and stuff, but just due to how things have been lately, I didn't really have the drive to do anything super outrageous this time around, but I still wanted to cover something significant after my original plans for this video fell through, and that's when I realized there was a pivotal ancient DOS game in my possession I hadn't yet covered, as it was released right at the beginning of Hardware Accelerated Gaming, that game being Tomb Raider. So here's a fun fact. I never played any of the Tomb Raider games up until now, with one exception. And by coincidence, that exception happens to be the Wii port of Tomb Raider Anniversary, which is the modernized remake of this original game. And that actually puts me in a really interesting position, because it means I'm already technically familiar with the game, but from a remastered sense, meaning I can take an objective look back and see just how much things were changed, seeing what worked, what didn't, differences in structure, differences in controls. And oh boy, I knew there'd be differences, but yikes. So I will admit, the remake added a lot of unnecessary extra features, like having to make carbon brushings of things and such. But one thing the remake absolutely improved on was the gameplay. The gameplay here in the first game is okay, but incredibly janky. You have to be extraordinarily precise about your movements outside of combat, and the combat itself is pretty much a war of attrition if you don't learn a very important trick to survival, which the game doesn't help you figure out at all. But the core of the gameplay was, and always has been, about exploration. And that's one of the big things Tomb Raider had going for it, is that there's a lot of exploration to be had here. I only had enough time to get roughly halfway through the game when capturing footage for this video, partly because there's death traps everywhere and no checkpoints, so anytime you forget to save, you're going to be doing a bunch of things over again. But mostly because the levels are massive, the puzzles are often surprisingly challenging given how basic they really are, and since you have to be so precise with your movement, it takes a lot of time getting used to just getting around, often leading to moments where you think you might be sequence breaking because of some awkward jump, but no, you're doing what the developers intended. It just doesn't feel like it. Tomb Raider was developed by Core Design and originally published in 1996 by Eidos, though there were a huge number of releases of this game following, with the version I was given being a boxed copy of Tomb Raider Gold, which was released in 1997 and includes four additional levels, often considered to be the definitive version of the game to get if you can. And regardless, it's a one-player action-adventure game. Actually, quick look at the box here, since it's the only Eidos box I presently have, as during the mid to late 90s, their boxes were trapezoidal with a fold-up flap on the front. Now, my copy wasn't sealed, and there's nothing particularly noteworthy in the box, so there wasn't really a point to doing a full unboxing, but as you can see, it did include all of the extra bits the box normally came with. A demo CD filled with game demos, a full-color product catalog, and a registration card, all of which are considerably higher quality than what you would normally find in game boxes of this vintage. But back to the game stats, it primarily supports VGA 320x200 and SVGA 640x480 graphics, running in 256 colors, as well as a wide variety of digitized audio devices. However, this game also includes support for a surprisingly large number of early 3D accelerators, which I think is another reason why the game was as well received as it was. The mid-90s hardware accelerated gaming was rough. Everyone had their own APIs, there's no real consistency between any of them, so oftentimes games only supported one or two cards or APIs because it was just too much hassle, or sometimes impossible, to support a wide array. But this game does, meaning it was much more accessible to early adopters of hardware accelerated graphics on the PC. That said, if you're familiar with how Tomb Raider's supposed to look, then you might be wondering why it looks somewhat off here. And no matter what, the game's internally limited to 640x480 as a maximum rendering resolution, even when hardware accelerated. But the only way I could capture footage at that resolution with the hardware accelerated graphics was to stare at a tiny window on my monitor. As attempts to enlarge it didn't work, unless I scaled up the actual rendering resolution beyond its natural limit, which did make the window bigger, but resulted in much cleaner graphics than this game should have, and also weird issues with straight lines, as some of the effects in the game rely on the pixels of these lines being a certain size. I ultimately opted for the higher rendering resolution, but this is only an issue because I was trying to capture footage with the original DOS executable. As for its current release state, it's still commercial and you have a few options for getting the game nowadays. 
Now, if you just want the first Tomb Raider game and nothing else, you can get it on Steam for only $7. Now, if you want the first three Tomb Raider games as a cheaper package, you can get that on GOG for only $10. However, I don't believe either of those come with the gold content. But there are patches and downloads out there for getting that extra content going if you don't have the original gold release, along with a slew of other fan-made patches and such to help get the original games working on modern systems. Now, if you want a physical copy, this can get a little crazy because there's a massive number of releases, coupled with the game being more well known on consoles than on the PC. As such, you'll find about a dozen PlayStation and Saturn copies for sale for every one copy of a computer version, though none of it is even remotely rare, and the prices tend to reflect that, with most loose copies of the PC game going for around $10, and fully boxed copies going for between $30 and $45, regardless of if it's the original release or the gold release. Though for all the collections this game appears in, it's kind of a bit harder to judge how much those various collections should be going for, as they were the rare ones in the bunch. All of that said, there's a few things to keep in mind if you want to acquire the game specifically to play it. Now, firstly, if you're not precisely interested in playing the original game, just the original story, you may want to get Tomb Raider Anniversary instead. It has tons more quality of life improvements, is more compatible overall, fleshes out the story better. It's just the better way to go if the retro aesthetic and controls is not what you're looking for. Now, secondly, because of the massive number of sequels, remakes, and reboots, it can be surprisingly challenging to sort all of that out from the original game. Now, looking specifically for the gold release or adding the year 1996 to your search tends to help. And lastly, do not get the quote sold out release of the game if you're looking to play it, because that release was shoddily done and is missing all of the CD audio tracks, which would mean no mid-level ambience and no mid-game cutscene dialogue. Good to skip on having a dedicated story section for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the game does a terrible job of telling the story and relays pretty much no backstory whatsoever. It's so bad that the CD includes an FAQ which has an entire section at the end dedicated to explaining what's going on from the start of the game to the end. Yeah, it's that bad. The other reason, though, is because the story's actually pretty much a throwaway. You play as Lara Croft, an aristocrat turned survivalist from being the sole survivor of a plane crash, turned writer slash treasure hunter, who's always up for a challenge when it comes to finding ancient artifacts, with the pay being secondary to the thrill. An old acquaintance, Jacqueline Notla, contacts Lara about finding a mysterious artifact said to contain magic powers located in a tomb in the mountains of Peru thus beginning an incredibly dangerous trek through various long-forgotten locations as you discover there's more to this artifact than you're being told, and more than one piece of it to locate. Now while you can just jump straight into the main gameplay, one thing you're going to want to do first is play through the tutorial segments in Lara's home. Now, even though this is literally just a controls tutorial, you cannot skip this. And I don't mean that in the sense that the game doesn't let you, but that if you don't understand the nuances of this game's controls, you're not getting anywhere. And I actually tried to just dive right into the gameplay and got stuck the first time I had to jump up a small cliff. Now, I'll be going over the controls in more detail later, but just bear in mind as you're watching the gameplay that you need to be extremely precise about what you're doing. That's why there's often a lack of flow to the actions that I'm performing. Actually, one thing I find incredulous is when you get to the end of the tutorials in Lara's home and get treated to this line of dialogue. Right. Now I'd better take off these wet clothes. Yeah, it's not lost on me that one of the main ways they marketed this game was to horny teenage boys, but I'm not here to focus on that. I'm more concerned with how the game plays as a game. And as far as the gameplay is concerned, it's pretty straightforward. By default, Lara runs around and you have additional controls for jumping, slowing down, sidestepping, switching between combat and non-combat modes, looking around, opening your inventory, doing a quick roll forward followed by a 180 degree turnaround, and a general action button. In combat, the action button is for shooting your guns, but outside of combat, the action button is used for a huge variety of actions, including activating switches, picking up items, leaping up short or tall ledges that you're right next to, reaching out to grab ledges while already in the air or hopping backwards off of a ledge, holding on to edges so that you can shimmy across them, and grabbing onto pushable blocks to either push or pull them. 
I uh, suppose I should mention now that there's no mouse controls at all. Everything is either done with the keyboard or a joystick of some kind. But since DOS never properly supported more than four buttons per joystick, the game really doesn't play well like that. Not without using modern emulation tools anyways. The point though is that because there's no mouse controls, you also don't have any direct control over the camera most of the time. There is a button you can hold down to look around, but apart from shooting your guns, you can't really do much else while looking around in this manner. You have to be at a standstill. To that end, the camera does end up getting a bit annoying at times, but usually you can manage just fine despite this. Generally speaking, the goal of each level is to simply get to the end. Some levels are fairly linear, while others tend to have a central area of some sort that you have to find a way beyond, either by solving multiple puzzles in other areas, acquiring various items like gears or keys, and while the levels themselves can be deviously designed in terms of getting around, like this extremely vertical room here which just go to hell, it's generally not too convoluted what you have to do to succeed, but it can definitely take a lot of investigation to figure things out. To that end, there's one extremely important thing to keep in mind as you're moving around. The levels are made of cubes. Heck, the level structure seems incredibly similar to System Shock, where the map is basically just a grid of squares, with each valid square, which is part of the level layout, having floors and ceilings with various heights and slope settings, as well as additional floors and ceilings to make up floating sections. The reason this is important is because of how you jump and grab ledges. The jumping in this game is a precision skill and typically comes down to either doing a standing jump or a running jump, as well as either reaching out to grab a ledge or not. A standing jump clears a one cube gap, a running jump clears a two cube gap, reaching out to grab the other side extends either jump by one additional cube, and if there's a significant height difference, you have to consider that as well. Now, if you're doing a diagonal jump between cubes, then you also have to consider that the ledge grabbing mechanic may not work if it's too sharp of a diagonal. In fact, pretty much everything in this game is a precision skill. For instance, if you want to pick up an item, you have to be standing exactly over top when you press the action button. You can't even just hold the action button and walk over top. You need to be standing still when you press it, since holding the action button while running causes the game to instead constantly check to see if you can climb up a ledge. Now, using switches and levers is the same. You have to be right up next to it and turn to face it. If your turn's slightly wrong or literally a few pixels too far away, you can't use it. Ironically though, this precision disappears underwater. If you're underwater, you get a lot more leeway and can pick up items and pull levers with a lot less accuracy. About the only thing that's not a precision skill is combat as the combat in this game is super freaking janky, at least if you don't know what you're doing. Alara can switch in and out of combat mode with the spacebar, and while in combat mode, pressing the action button will cause her to fire her selected gun immediately. However, while in combat mode, Lara will constantly move her arms and head to look at a nearby enemy within a certain range. If you then hold the action button down, Lara now locks her sight onto that enemy and will automatically attack when the enemy is able to be attacked and stop attacking when the enemy is obscured. Plus, Lara is now able to hit that enemy regardless of range. Now, this locking mechanic is useful but has a couple drawbacks. The first is that it does not automatically switch targets if your target dies. You have to figure out on your own accord whether you can stop shooting by releasing the action button, thus allowing Lara to lock onto a different enemy in the vicinity. Plus, while locked on, your camera will always turn to face your locked target, but your movement is still locked relative to Lara's orientation, so it can become surprisingly disorienting trying to run alongside an enemy or turn to face another while still focused on a different enemy that's about to die. Not to mention, most enemies move as fast as or even faster than Lara. So at first glance, the combat is going to seem balanced against your favor and that you're going to be routinely taking damage in every fight. However, it is possible to get out of most fights without taking a single hit once you remember to jump. Now you can perform somersaults in all four main directions relative to the direction you're facing, forward, backward, left, and right, and these moves not only disorient your adversaries but allow you to get out of the way of attacks while still firing your guns the entire time. Once you start jumping around in combat, you will be taking a lot less damage. 
Well, until you start dealing with human opponents. At the end of the first act, you get your first taste of this as you get out of some water and some guy just starts capping you constantly with his guns. And then throughout the entire second act, there's another guy you have to deal with on a routine basis, and every time you pump him full of lead, he just runs off and disappears until his next predetermined encounter is triggered. I mean, don't get me wrong, without the human opponents, or things you fight very late in the game, this could essentially just be rebranded as Lara Croft Wildlife Exterminator, or heck, even Dinosaur Hunter, since guess what else you get to fight at the end of the first act? Velociraptors and a giant T-Rex. Okay, that was a pretty badass way to go. Also, what? Freaking dinosaurs? Ignoring the many incongruities and impossibilities with having dinosaurs exist on this planet in modern times, how the heck would they even live in this mountain and have literally no one noticed them for thousands of years? Also, I'm pretty sure none of the wolves around these parts would have survived a week with these dinosaurs, let alone long enough to be a threat to Lara. Oh yeah, and that health bar that appears in the corner? Sometimes it feels like it doesn't even exist, because what would a treasure hunt through ancient structures be without death traps? And oh boy, does this game love its death traps. Pretty much every step of the way, you're going to be faced with a trap of some sort, which is going to be instantly fatal, or fairly close to, which you'll need to find a way to dodge on the first try, or die in the attempt. Some of these traps I kinda get, as they're traditional for treasure hunting fare, like rolling boulders or collapsing floors. But then you used to have stuff like this electric disco balls, like in ancient ruins, where's it even getting its power from? Or how about this one, falling homing swords. Yeah, that's one thing you really have to get used to with this game, is that it takes a ton of creative liberties, possibly too many given the context. But so long as you're okay with the realism being shattered by the very unrealistic things going on, then it's not really that big a deal. But I'll tell you what is a big deal. Yeah, we need to talk about this game's controls because my word are they convoluted. It's not even that the controls are bad, because really, they're not. But you are frequently pressing three keys at a time in a specific order to get Lara to do exactly what you need her to do, and there's often no margin for error. This is something that was addressed to a massive degree in Tomb Raider Anniversary, which plays a lot smoother and more naturally with a lot more freedom of movement, so they clearly knew the old control scheme was bad. But just how bad is it? Well, before we dive into a typical nightmare scenario, there's two annoying things to keep in mind, specifically if you want to customize the controls. Firstly, the game has two sets of controls, referred to as default controls and user controls. Now you're allowed to set the user controls to whatever you want, it's just there's a problem. The default controls cannot be overridden. This means if you wanted to say, put jump on spacebar, nope, not happening because spacebar is the default control for taking out and putting away your guns. The game will still let you put spacebar onto a user control, but it's not going to work, I've tried. Or at least if it does work, it's not going to be consistent as to what does or doesn't work in this regard. And secondly, the shift keys are the defaults used for walking at a slower speed so that you don't walk off of ledges or can turn around more precisely. But for some reason, I had problems getting the shift keys to register, and I'm not entirely certain if this was an emulation issue or not. Now my solution, since I was keeping one hand at the bottom left corner of my keyboard, was to set my user control for walking to the Z key. But that's just something to keep in mind in case you have any issues in regards to walking not working consistently, because it's absolutely supposed to. But virtually everything you have to do in this game is a combination of two or three keys at a time, and it can become a nightmare trying to get your fingers to constantly switch between everything you need to do. For instance, if you need to clear a three cube gap, this can only be done with a running jump from the very edge of a ledge while grabbing the ledge on the other side. To set this up, first you hold down the walk key and move into position at the very edge of the ledge you intend to jump from and carefully line yourself up to jump as straight as possible. I should note, so long as you hold the walk key down, Lara will not walk off of any ledges she couldn't step up or down from naturally. Next, you let go of walk and tap the down arrow to make a quick jump backwards to give yourself the precise amount of running space needed before jumping. The game has a very weird smart jumping mechanic, whereby if you're running towards the edge of a cube and you press the jump button, 
you won't jump automatically. There's instead a delay based on the precise distance you get from making a quick hop backwards. And if you don't have enough space to account for this delay, you'll fail to jump and just run off the edge. If you give yourself too much space, the delay doesn't kick in and you instead jump immediately when you press the jump button, meaning you'll jump far too early and thus you won't have enough distance to clear the gap. And I should point out, fall damage adds up very quickly, to the point where the first time I jumped down from somewhere I didn't think was too high, I died on impact and thought falling too far was just going to be flat out fatal. It wasn't until later that I realized it was a health drop. Not instantly fatal, but it's a health drop that adds up very fast. So, you've edged up to the ledge, hopped backwards, and are ready to take your leap. Next, you hold down the forwards key and immediately hold down jump following, being extra careful not to press jump first. If you press jump first followed by forwards, you instead do a standing forward jump instead of a running jump, which will send you into the gap and possibly to your doom. And then, even after all of this, you still have to hold down the action key while airborne to reach out and grab the ledge on the other side, and once you grab the ledge, you have to remember to press up to pull yourself up before you let go of the action key, otherwise you just let go and drop straight down from the ledge. Yeah, and this is all just to clear a 3 cube gap. Even though the controls themselves are straightforward, because there's so many different actions attached to so many combinations of keys, you really need to be precise about what you're doing when a single mistake or pressing two keys in the wrong order can send you flying off a cliff and towards an instant death at the hands of gravity. Though that said, because you'll be finagling so many keys at a time, you may accidentally discover combinations which produce alternate effects that you weren't expecting. Like this one. You know, I'd make a joke about how incredibly not possible that looks, but at the same time, I'm gonna guess there's a video somewhere out there of some gymnast pulling this off. Regardless, the point is, you have to be extremely precise with the controls, or die. That simple. Suffice to say, I'm really glad you can save at any moment you want, and that the game generously gives you not one, not two, but 16 save slots to work with. <laughs> Overall, I found it really hard to enjoy the original Tomb Raider, but it's difficult to say how much of that was due to the nature of the game, or how much of that was because I'd already played Tomb Raider Anniversary, and thus already had expectations as to how a Tomb Raider game should play. The thing is, when it comes down to it, the game really does have a unique atmosphere and impressive visuals for the time. I mean, come on, Quake had only been out for a few months by this point. And even though the controls are super finicky and difficult to get used to, they are responsive and they do what they're supposed to when you press them in the right order. I guess when it comes down to it, this isn't a bad game, it just didn't age well. And all I have to do is play both this and Tomb Raider Anniversary back to back to realize just how sharp in contrast the playability is. It was still neat going back to the original and seeing how the legacy began, but really, if you've never played the original or Anniversary, play Anniversary and save yourself the headache. Not true, Anniversary isn't a perfect game either, but it's the same story and locations, just expanded upon, embellished a bit, and with way better controls. Yeah, do not play this in DOSBox. There's been a lot of fan attention given to the series over the years, and thus one of the far better ways to play the original Tomb Raider nowadays is by using the fan-made engine known as Tomb Raider 1 Community Edition, or Tomb 1 Main for short. It's not actually a source port, since the source code for the game was never released, and is instead a reverse engineering project which served to update and enhance the original to make playing the game a much nicer experience on modern hardware, with tons of bug fixes and extra configuration options as well. It's still actively being updated as of my making this video, and a link to it can be found in the video description. Keeping in mind you still need to actually own the game to play this, since for obvious reasons it does not contain any of the assets of the game. If you absolutely must play the original in DOSBox, then there's a few things to keep in mind. The first is that, without a special build of DOSBox which can tie in with legacy hardware accelerated graphics tools, you're going to be stuck running the non-hardware accelerated version of the game, which, even on period-correct hardware, doesn't perform all that well. 
I'm not entirely certain which build of DOSBox I'm using here, as I pulled it from the Steam release of the game, since by coincidence I own the Steam release as well, but it specifically works best with the Voodoo Rush build of the game from the original CDs, and is using OpenGlide to tie into the rendering API. Now, secondly, while hardware accelerated, the game plays with the gamma of your display in order to do effects like fading to black. Now, since those effects tie in with display gamma as opposed to being actual on-screen effects, this is why you haven't been seeing any such fades in this video in any spots where you might be expecting one. What this also means is if the game closes unexpectedly while the gamma is still altered, there won't be a way to properly fix the gamma without rebooting your entire computer, as the gamma settings in your drivers will not have been altered, and attempting to alter them just makes the problem worse. And lastly, choose the Gravis Ultrasound as your sound device. Now, normally, Sound Blaster is the simplest choice to get working with an old game in DOSBox, but for some reason, the stereo effects are very messed up emulated, and I'm not entirely certain why. Heck, maybe it's even a problem with the game itself and happens on real hardware. I don't actually know. Either way, if you choose Gravis Ultrasound as your sound device in DOSBox, you will not only get mono sound, but it's properly centered and thus doesn't sound like it's predominantly coming out of one side of your speakers. You may also have to adjust the mixer volume levels, as I found the ambience effects coming out of the CD audio far too loud this way by default. Anywho, that's all for the 300th episode of Ancient DOS Games. And in a couple Saturdays from now, on the 18th, I'm going to have a filler video to close out Season 6 and talk about what to expect for ADG going forward. But until then, thanks to everyone who's been watching this crazy ride unfold and spreading the word about it, regardless of when it was when you boarded the ship, be it within the past few days, past few months, or even as far back as May of 2010 when the series first began properly. Now, I will say, there's not going to be any huge changes going forward into Season 7, but do check back in a couple weeks all the same if you're curious as to what I have in store. Thanks for watching, everyone, and extra special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small set of you guys.